All right, listen up. Welcome back to the Construction Mentor Podcast. My name is Ike. I am your host. You can follow me on Instagram and TikTok at the Construction Mentor. Uh, you can catch this podcast on Spotify, Apple, or YouTube. Uh, what are we here to do? We are here to educate people. We are here to open up doors uh, in the construction industry, whether that's you know pushing a broom, somebody in the field wearing boots and jeans, or somebody uh, in the office, somebody that wants to become their own entrepreneur. Uh, there is no better industry better industry to get involved in, um, to open yourself to a plethora of opportunities. Uh, there truly is no end road and there is no glass ceiling. And today uh, we are going to get into a profession that we haven't got to yet. Uh, we've been focusing a lot on the trades and a lot of the general contractor content, but we have an architect uh, on with us today. First one ever actually uh, somebody that I've known for quite a long time. We went to school together way back when, 10, 12, 15 years ago. I don't even know what time is like uh, these days. It was a long time ago, but we have Vinny Lemma. You can follow him at Trinity uh, Designs LLC on Instagram, uh, especially if you're an aspiring young architect. Super interesting content, um, very clean, very well put together content that uh, I think can get, generate your mind and give you a little exposure to what an architect actually does. So with that, Vinny, how are you? Good, man. How you doing? Doing fantastic. Now, before I forget, uh, Vinny Lemma, if you couldn't tell, is Italian, right? Um, uh, Vinny from New York. And yep. what were you just telling me about your grandfather's company and what it's called? Because what's your other Instagram handle? Yeah, so my other Instagram handle is actually uh, Amel Construction. It's my last name backwards. So uh, Vinny Lemma and my construction company is Amel Construction. So I, I dabble in design build work where we have a architecture firm and a construction firm. But the construction firm is named Amel because it's it's actually my last name backwards. My grandfather was building back in the 50s, a little bit less, uh, you know, uh, love towards Italians back then. And they were trying to be more Americanized. So he just, OK, fine, just switch the last name to Amel. And uh, yeah, so a lot of times when I show up for an estimate, people are kind of confused. They don't realize till they see a business card that it's really uh, just just our name. That's, that's, uh, that's funny. I mean, I guess it's not really that funny considering that he was trying to like avoid racism and stuff like that, <laughs> but it is, but it is pretty cool. So, um, your exposure to construction and architecture, uh, was very early. I mean, it sounds like this is your like third generation in the sure. industry, right? Yes. Yeah. So my, um, my grandfather was like a 1950s builder, very similar to like, you'd hear like Levittown, New York, when they were doing those big mm -hmm. developments. He was a couple towns over, so he built hundreds, if not a thousand homes on Long Island, uh, production World War II homes. Uh, then my father in the 80s got into more of the home improvement remodeling aspect of it. Uh, entrepreneur in his own right, started up as a handyman. Now he's, you know, 45 years into the business and he's a master carpenter. Um, and then I pretty much hung out on job sites and started doing construction work. Uh, with him and uh, eventually diverged into deciding to get an architecture degree and pursuing that aspect as well. So you're the first one in your family to get involved in architecture. Everybody else was in a yep. trade. So everyone was strictly trade. Um, the reason why I went into architecture, I would say, is we kind of had that family unit conversation where, um, which I know is a topic on your podcast a lot, is, you know, should you go to college and not? And what we felt was if I was going to go to college, we wanted to be something that we could parlay into a licensure. So mm -hmm. we didn't want, we didn't really, I didn't feel it was important for me to go to college just to get a degree. So my dad being a self-made businessman, I didn't really know if I needed an MBA or construction management degree because mm -hmm. we knew that whatever we did was more on the smaller scale. Um, if it was mm -hmm. corporate, maybe I could see a different reason for that. So we said, if we were going to, you know, if I was going to go to school, what would be something that we could do? Well, if you got a degree in architecture or engineering, eventually that could be a stepping stone to a license and something else that you could do. Um, you know, similar to like an accountant has to get a degree or a lawyer has to get a degree. Right. So that's uh, that's interesting. And I, I always want to make sure that we're highlighting and making making the path clear for young people. So the first thing that you talked about is that your family, obviously, because they were in the business, they understand the importance of a license. And what I try to tell um, younger people all the time is, what a license allows you to do, and this is why if I recommend a trade, it's always MEP, right? Mechanical, electrical, plumbing. A license allows you to take responsibility for your work, right? And, and for you, that license would allow you to take responsibility for your design, 
uh, gives you some freedoms of permitting, you know, things like that. Um, so with an architect's license, what is the requirement? Like you went to school in Boston, but you went and got a license in New York. So sure. is it just the education? Is it also work experience? What's the licensing requirement for an architect? Yeah, so so the requirement, and it, it's, it's changed over the years for each, you know, next generation. Um, when I took it, you uh, you had to have a professional degree, which was a minimum of a four-year degree. You then had to have, uh, actually, it was a minimum of a five-year degree. So you either could have had a five-year bachelor's or you could have did, went for a master's. But at the end, it had to be certified. So you had to have a specific college degree. Mm -hmm. Then after that, you had to do pretty much a mentorship where you logged hours. When I did it, it was about 5,600, about 6,000 hours. Um, that that usually part, you know, it's going on at the same time as you're working. Uh, and then uh, so your that, mentorship, your 3,000, 6,000 hour mentorship, that would be three years of like an apprenticeship or, you know, working yep. as an architect, which you yep. then have you, to prove with some sort of paperwork, right? Like an example yep. of your work. Yeah, you got to you get like NCARB, uh, the National Accrediting Board, and you have to actually get it signed off. And there's certain things they'll make sure that you're working on site planning. They'll make sure you're working on MVP. They, they try to make sure you, you get to see the whole circuit of work. And then eventually after that, um, you have to sit for your exams. They've changed it now where those pathways um, is actually architecture is a bit of a declining profession. So they're trying to make it more easier. So they've been switching up uh, when you can do all this and some of it can happen at the same mm -hmm. time. But when I did it, it was step by step by step. Um, and then I had to take seven exams to pass people before me had to take nine exams. Seven. Um, now, they're, now they're down to six. So they, 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 it's not that they're getting easier. They're just changing them around. Um, so you have to go through that whole process and then eventually get a license. Uh, it's a very long process. It's not really a get out of school. Thing. So I think, you know, no matter what license you go to get, I th a lot of young people just think that they can go like pass a test or something and then just start their own business. Um, it's not that easy. <laughs> so yeah. like in architecture, he just told you, you need a, a five-year degree. And then even after that, you have to have a certain amount of work experience. It's the same thing for an engineer, right? If mm -hmm. you're a mechanical engineer or an electrical engineer, you need to have a four-year degree usually, and then four to eight, depending on where you got your degree from and their accreditation, you need four to eight years of experience, work experience. Um, covering all different kinds of fields before you can actually become an engineer and get your license. Uh, and once you have that license though, then you're able to write a higher ticket, right? That that's, I mean, you started, mm -hmm. you kind of got into the family business and then took it a different direction. But if you wanted to start your own thing or you wanted to do become a freelancer or a private consultant or, you know, something like that, that's what you're looking at. You're looking at like a eight to 10 year process of work before you can get your own license. Uh, on yeah, the design side. Yeah, it's a long, it's a, it's a bit of a long road. Um, and, but I would say it's, it's completely worth it. Um, you know, anyone who tells you that you don't need a license, you don't, you don't need a license. You can just, you can work in architecture and be fine, but getting your license is really betting on yourself. Um, there's a joke that it's an old man profession because, you know, there are, you, you can pretty much do this for a very, very long long time period and mm -hmm. with technology today and being able to move and travel and do what you want to do um it just really it just changes the door if you, if you get your license because you don't even have to practice architecture you are just now an, an accredited professional in your in your field you can like right. you as you said be a consultant you can there's so many other doors that open when you just put those ra letters next to your name um so i highly recommend it so now you, you're your own business, so your compensation isn't necessarily reflective of the market. Sure. What does what does somebody starting out in architecture, not a licensed architect, but coming out of school, um, let's just stick to the New York area. Like, what would an architect expect to make coming out of school? I would say it would it would really depend the niche that you go into. If you're going into um, like uh, just say like Manhattan, a general. Uh, big market city. Um, I would say you're probably around $55,000, $60,000 a year. It's not okay. tremendous. So high. It's, it's a, an average. Um, but I would say it is can quickly incline with you uh, moving from firm mm -hmm. to firm. Um, I have friends who have step zoned in four and a half years to get salaries that are you know, double that by being able to 
work at this firm for two years, work here for a year, work someone else for a year, and you can quickly move around. Um, but I would say they do want their pound of flesh for the first year or so to to see where you're at. But um, okay. it does have well, its advantage. I don't think that's the worst thing in the world. And to your point earlier, where you said that architecture is kind of a dying industry, not a lot of young people are going into it. When I graduated, you know, and people were people were looking at coming out from like 08 to 2012. Sure. It was lower. I mean, in Boston, a lot of people were starting with salaries in the 40s. Yep. But now people have, people are up around the 60s, which is above a good chunk, like 10% above the national average for a college sure. graduate. And like you said, you go around the block a couple of times within a couple of years, you're doubling that salary. And it's purely because yeah. of supply and demand. And if you can actually get a niche where this divert, this is where you get into the conversation of if you actually need to be licensed or not. But I have friends who have found their niches in like uh, facade engineering or, uh, you mm -hmm. know, uh, detailing in specific aspects like historic preservation where they'll, you'll, you'll make really good money consulting where you're, you're no longer just, um, you know, you're in the realm of architecture, but you have a specific thing that you work on and uh, you can do quite well if you, if you find that little spot. I just had an episode a few episodes ago titled Riches in the Niches. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> the more you can become an expert on something specific, sure. um, you know, you get to charge accordingly. So with you now, are you only doing your own architecture or are you selling architectural services to, you know, homeowners? Yeah. So, we, yeah. So I, um, I have the two firms and I have them purposely uh, branded uh, separately. Um, so I do ton so we do design build work, uh, but I like to say that the construction company and the architecture company are their two biggest, you know, clients, but um, we do sell a ton of work direct. I would say it's about 50 50 for the architecture where we're out there and we we right now if we have about seven seven boards, you know, I would say it's about about half, you know, that we're going out there and we're actually dealing direct to homeowner. Um, mm -hmm. the design build on the construction end. A lot of people love to have the architect tied into that. So people call us if they want to put a second floor in their home. I say, do they have plans? If they say yes, we put a bid in. If they say they don't have plans, I say, would you like me to give you an offer? And a, a lot of times we'll lock in that as a design build. Um, right. But, so design build is pretty intuitive uh, concept. Yeah. Right? Yeah, <laughs> you can probably right. guess it's when you hire the same person that you're hiring to build it is also coming up with the drawings. Now, a lot of people... Um, would think why wouldn't everybody do that so are there advantages to one way or the other are there advantages to somebody else using somebody else's drawings and getting hired just to build um versus owning the whole thing from soup to nuts what's your perspective so, there i think it really comes down to your budget because if you're ex if you're extremely 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 budget conscious there is a thought process of paying an architect and putting the job out to bid and then not mm. being locked in from an early standpoint. Um, that is what people think when they when they don't do design build. We tend to find if you can get with the right design build team, it doesn't have to be me. There's tons of other people who are out there who are good. You will actually save more money in the long term because of value engineering, being mm. smart up front, how to plan it, having the same people, less bureaucracy. Um, so that's the reason why some people are hesitant because They'll call you up and they'll say, oh, I, you know, I don't know if I want to lock into this guy. You know, most of our customers are average uh, homeowners. You know, these are middle class people and mm -hmm. the jobs we're doing are life changing for them. These are their the biggest investment they'll make besides buying their home. Um, so they're some people are more cautious to just say, hey, I'm going to put everything in one basket. Um, they really want to shop it. So that's mm -hmm. that's where it's at, you know, but. Most people, what I recommend is to go out, roughly speak to what contractor you want first, get an idea of who you like and some rough idea on pricing, and then go to that contractor and say, who's your architect? For us, that happens to be me, so it's design build. But if it was someone right. else and they said, hey, I work with this guy, Joe, and he's a fantastic architect, I would recommend that you should go work with Joe uh, you know, over my other company because they have a great rapport that you know that firm. Right. Yeah, and I think on the commercial side, you know, what I do, I think that a lot of clients want the checks and balances of an architect kind of keeping a, a GC accountable and a GC keeping an architect accountable and vice versa. Different playing field, though. With sure. homeowners, you know, they're not looking to get 
in some type of like arbitration or like check and balance mm-hmm. argument, you know, they, I think there's a benefit to homeowners to have one throat to choke yeah. <laughs> uh, for lack of a better word, right? One person to go to, dude, you designed this whole thing. You told me it was going to cost this much. That's exactly it. You know, yeah. you, you, you picked this up, you picked out this detail, you picked out this finish. Like, don't tell me that you didn't know, <laughs> you know yep, what I mean? That's, or that the detail and that's what, is incomplete. And that's what we try to sell. We try to sell people that, you know, when we give them a preliminary estimate that we're not going to come back later and be double the price because we we are the people designing it. So you, you hit the nail on the head there. And, and like you cool. said, in a competitive bid situation, like, you know, if contractors are hungry for the work and they're really trying to compete, um, they might not throw everything in the bid because they're trying to remain competitive. And you might not find that out until later. Where again, yep. if the same person designing it is the same person building it, there's no questions. You you captured everything in the bid. You know what it takes to build this job. Design design build always is better because you said it's just one person. It's a lot, it's a better, it's a leap of faith on the customer, but it always ends up with a better product. And there's also a sense of pride because, you know, if I'm designing the house and I'm building it at the end of the day, let's be honest, I really want it to be great. Like, I mean, when I build a house, I always, I own it and I want it to be awesome. But if someone walks by and they go, oh, that window looks a little weird or that's a little, I'm like, well, you know, we did the best we could. This was the plans. Whereas if I design, yeah. build it, you know, if I see something in the field and it looks like, oh, this isn't what I was envisioning, you know, I'll admit a mistake. I'll tell a homeowner, listen, I, I think we got to ship this. This isn't exactly what I thought. We have to move this. So there's definitely a, a, a benefit of pride with the design, build aspect. Nice. Um, I think that's such a unique perspective. Um, and I, I'm glad that I had you on because I, I don't think I've had anybody on to give, um, number one, the architect's perspective, but number two, the residential perspective. Um, so can I ask, how do you price as a on the architecture side? Is it sure. per job? Are you charging per hour? Like, what is it? So I mean, I basically get an, an overhead rate of what it would take me for a day to be, you know, really to dumb it down. And I, I honestly break it up into the architectural stages of like existing conditions, uh, you know, uh, zoning analysis, design, design development, uh, construction documents, permitting, and then if there's going to be any CA work, and really just try to put together a bit of how long I think it's going to take. Um, and then, you know, based off of like anything else, the the profitability we also want to put on the project. And uh, we put it out there. I mean, we we do, you know, my firm specifically, we really focus on high quality construction documents. Um, mm-hmm. We're good designers, but we really try to have good CD sets. So, you know, you, you're going to pay more for us because we, we think up front to try to alleviate problems in the field. Um, you know, so we might be a little bit more money than some other firms, but we think in the long run that helps out. Um, you know, so everyone has their own approach. the process that you just described isn't any different, whether you're doing residential or you're doing commercial you know big big commercial stuff for like a fortune 500 company so existing conditions basically and i I just want to walk through this step by step for people so existing conditions basically means you're going out there you're checking out literally what existing conditions are right like what's what exists today um you try to find out things that are screwed up you try to find out how you're going to connect to things change structures yada yada um and then you go into design development so What's what's that stage to get to a DD set, a detailed design set? Yeah, so basically at, the way we work is that, um, and we, we dabble in some commercial work, but what we do is um, a lot of times if we're doing larger, if we're doing bigger than like light retail, meaning like strip malls or small offices, then we'll partner with, a, with somebody, um, which we've done mm-hmm. in the past, in terms of ours that uh, my old mentor that I'll work with will do bigger stuff. Um, but uh, to do a DD set basically is um, we have all the structure is laid out, but maybe not everything is sized at that time. So we have elevations, we have sections, we have all the beams. We've even specified, is this going to be steel? Is it going to be uh, engineered lumber? Is it, you know, dimensional, normal lumber, or nominal lumber? Um, we, we get that all broken out, but maybe we haven't sized all the calculations yet uh, just to make sure that uh, it's what the client wants before we really get into all oh. the detail. Uh, when you and when he says elevations, basically, I, I always like to say if you look at a cake on a table and you kind of put your head down and you're looking directly at that cake, that's your elevation, right? And yep. if you cut that cake open, you take a slice out and you can see the different layers inside the cake, that's your section, right? So it, he's literally presenting a cake to people and then, you know, developing a, a layout from there. 
Um, and then CD set would be, you know, when you actually, you, you take the design to the level where you can actually build off of it. Right. And then, and then you're in for permitting and stuff like that. Right. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so how, how did you start marketing these services? So you walked in the ammo construction, ammo construction was an existing business that you took over. Yeah. Well, and, and then you come in with this new skill set. How'd you, how'd you take that new skill set and make people aware of it? So for about 10 years, I moonlighted under a very skilled architect and uh, I just quickly started. Um, if people would call, as I mentioned, and needed work, I just kind of started as a snippet out there. I would say, hey, I also work for this architect and uh, I'm, a, I'm a PM for him. I'm a draftsman if you need the work. So I, I was very lucky because for Although I wasn't licensed yet for 10 years, I was basically doing what I wanted to do as a side hustle mm -hmm. uh, at the back burner. Um, and then during that time period, um, so many subcontractors got to know me. And the subcontractors are really key because they work for other GCs. So these other subcontractors, if a framer or a foundation guy or a mason, they would go have 10 GCs they work for. They would then go say, hey, listen, I got this other guy, Vinny. He, you know, he has a construction company, um, but don't worry about that because he's an honest guy and he's also has a separate architecture firm and you should give him a shot. And I would meet these people and, and they would sometimes be nervous at first that, you know, are you going to take my work? Or, and I said, listen, it's a small, I, we're on Long Island. It's a small island here. You know, reputations are everything. Just give me the opportunity. And if I could typically get one GC to give me one job, they would realize the value I had that I had the hands on experience in construction that I would get the rest of their work. That that was okay. really key for me is they, they get the subcontractors on board. So that's that's interesting because a lot of people that I've had on, um, it was like they went directly to social media and it was a mix of word of mouth and social media and kind of growing. Um, you know, you, you one thing that I tell all people. The best advice that I can give anybody is network, network, network. It's all about word of mouth, making connections and having people refer you, um, build that, build that perception, build that reputation for yourself. And in this industry where everyone is so hungry for talent, uh, the opportunities are going to follow. Right. And you, you obviously did that very well. Um, before I get into, uh, cause I want to hear what advice you have for young people. Talk about how important mentorship was to you, because I, I always tell people education is one thing. But the mm -hmm. best education that you can get is mentorship. Yeah, I actually had um, you'll I think this, you'll find this interesting. Um, I had a co-op uh, from the college that you and I went to. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we went to Wentworth Institute of Technology uh, in Boston. And um, I had a choice between working at Harvard, the Dana-Farber Cancer Research Center, mm -hmm. or to go work at an architecture firm on Long Island. I was an RA at the time, which meant that I could have lived in Boston for free, worked at Harvard and made more money during the recession than some people. Or I had the option to move back home, live with my parents, make little to no money, but work at an architecture firm. I said no to Harvard, moved back home, and I met a person there. His name is Brian Franco. He's an amazing architect. And... I ended up working at this firm twice. Eventually, when he got his license, he went on his own. And I mentored underneath him for 10 years, would not have passed my exams without him. Still a resource till this day. We still collaborate on projects till this day. And me saying no to Harvard um, was probably one of the greatest things I ever did. Um, I did, however, get one of our fellow alumni a job there. I actually called up Harvard and said, hey, I'm going to say no. But I know a girl who would be fantastic for I think she still works there. Um, and so she it worked out for both of us because I, I got to do what I wanted to do. She got a job. I think she's still there, has a family in, in Boston. Um, and I've had this mentor who's just been amazing to me. And uh, it's funny because everyone thought I was crazy at the time. They, they were like, why are you doing this? You should just stay in Boston. But I, I knew I didn't want to work on hospitals. You know, this, the Dana-Farber Cancer Research is research centers, laboratories. Right. Um, so that wasn't my niche. Well, it's such a interesting concept that, you know, it's hard for young people to grasp. I have a lot of people that are, you know, booking times to, for me to coach them on making big time career decisions and, or even just reaching out to me in DMS and just kind of texting me. And 
I keep telling them and I can tell they're reluctant when I say it, don't make $5 an hour decisions today over 10,000 or a hundred thousand decisions in 10 years, right? Don't jump on an opportunity just because it's a few extra dollars an hour today that might put you, might affect your career path and either enable or disable you from making hundreds of thousands of dollars down the road. I did the same thing um, a couple a couple years ago in my career, right? I, I took a huge pay cut to go chase an opportunity and I've almost been able to double my salary in three years. Exactly. That's all awesome. right. And it, because I knew that there was an opportunity there that I still had to perform, like, like nothing's guaranteed either. Um, sure. But take the opportunity, especially when you're young an opportunity to build a network where you want to be. Uh, so I give you a tremendous amount of credit for making that decision. And um, it's awesome to see that it's, it's, it's panned up. Uh, and again, mentorship. So other than creating a network, making that decision for maybe a little bit less money to get in the right mentorship situation, especially when you're young is one that you want to make. Absolutely. So I'd, I'd like to talk about um, a little bit of advice uh, in a few different areas. First of all, for those young people who are considering a, a, a career in architecture, considering going to college for architecture, what would you say to them? What, what should they be aware of going in? Well, as, as far as college, I would just I would I would just warn people a little bit that, you know, the architecture college is a bit of a different experience than than most people. It's not going to be what you see on like social media. It's um, I'm sure you had architecture friends when you were in school mm -hmm. and it's it's a lot of work. It's a little bit of a, a, a cult following to an extent. Uh, it's 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 great. Um, it's just a unique experience. So it's it's not going to be what you see on TV for what the stereotypical college experience would be. Um, but it's a, uh, you know, it's, you just gotta, they're going to weed you out quickly to who's, who's serious. Um, and that's a good thing and a, and a, and a bad thing. But, um, you know, I think in the long term it really, it puts you with people who want to stick with it. And I think that's, that's the, or, you know, the outcome. Um, if I would ever teach in my career, I would like to probably change a little bit, try mm -hmm. to have a better positive spin on things. Uh, Cause I don't think we need that much of a, that much of a culture that they put in, but um, yeah, it's just going to be a bit of a different experience with, uh, with college. Yeah. And I, one thing that I would say, you know, from my perspective, knowing, cause most of my friends, I mean, I was the only mechanical kid. Everybody else took architecture or construction management. You know, one of the good things about the industry as a whole is whatever you start in doesn't have to be what you end in. I think yeah. most people I know with architecture degrees actually are not in architecture anymore. 100%. I think it was because of the way the pay was 10 years ago compared to now. Yeah. Um, the people that stuck in it are definitely doing well, which is good. Um, how good do you have to be at math to be an architect? You don't have to be as good as they make it. Yeah. It, the, honestly, yeah that, you, that was the answer you, that I was looking for. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to be as good as you. Um, and I, you know, you really, you, so it's even funny because on your exams, um, you know, every point is valued the same, right? right? So like if there's, if there's, you know, uh, when we would take the exams, uh, if there was, you know, there's math problems, but like the three hard math problems, I mean, you just check that box and say, I'll go back later. And if you have time at yeah. the end, you, you, spend, you can't spend 32 minutes solving the problem. You don't have it, that. And the same question about, you know, uh, a, a you know geothermal is worth the same amount of points. So yeah, right. You do have to be good with math. You have to be good with concepts. Um, you, you know, but there is a you know, it's you don't have to be like an Einstein. You know, it's you can no, if you if, if you could pass college level math, you you, you can be. You yeah, can be I think I, I think if you if you can read a tape measure and you know you can add a, with a ruler a little bit, like yeah. it's. Uh, when I tell people that most architects I know, especially when I was in school, are horrible at math, they yeah. kind of look at me like, how's that possible? And I'm like, well, it's the math isn't that hard uh, yeah. to do it, right? You don't, you definitely don't have to be an Einstein. So I just say that not to put down architects. I say no. it, um, to not deter people from the profession sure. if they don't like math. You know, I, yeah. I think it's more about um, understanding codes and your aesthetic eye. And find, making it's making good. a space unique and important, making somebody feel you know unique and like they have a special. Yeah, design. construction means and methods are more important than the actual math. How to put something together is going to be right. 
you, you have the, you know, because after a while, well, if you get to a certain level of commercial, you're not even doing it. The, the engineer is. And if you're on residential, we, we spec all of our own structure, but we get ourselves, you get into a situation where you start creating a system where it's very easy for you to do it. Now that I'm established, I know, mm-hmm. you know, we're doing this, it's this, these are the loads, the charts set up. Um, you start giving yourself, you know, you know, very rarely am I sitting there for hours on a pro- a typical project is going to take me an hour and a half, two hours to do the right. whole math for the project. So that's, that's to get into it, right? What about a young person um, that might be coming out of school or maybe they just started their career? What would you say for them? Like showing up to work every day, what should they, what attitude should they have? What should they be doing to separate themselves from the crowd? Yeah, I, w- I would say, I mean, obviously similar, whether you're doing trade work or you're in an office is obviously, you know, hard work putting, you know, I know nowadays everyone has work-life balance and I respect that and I understand that, but I think going a little bit more really, you know, really stands out. I also think it's important to map your career. I think there's, you know, if you want to go work at a big firm and you want to be a, a star architect or an architect with a capital A, then you should put yourself in those positions. So go bang on doors, try to work for those type of people because it's not going to happen by chance. You know, if you if you don't have the street credit to go work at, uh, you know, Gensler right now or, or KPF or, you know, HOK, well, go look at their client list, you know, and mm-hmm. if their client list is someone that's, you know, maybe Under Armour or, or Chanel or someone, you, you might have a shot. You might know someone who works there to get your foot in the door. And if you can get into their architecture or their construction aspect of it, you know, I have so many people who will flip from one side. I know in the corporate world to the other side mm-hmm. um, and you can get your foot in the door like that. And I, I would say the same thing if you want to be more. Um, residential, or if you want to be more of your own boss, then I would not waste my time in one of those big firms for longer than, you know, two years or so, because I would get the experience, check the box, feel good about yourself, feel that you scratch that itch, learn what you can. And I would move on. Don't just, don't just work in one of those firms because that's what, you know, uh, the educational society is telling you, or that's what people are saying that you have to work in one of these big firms to be successful. And what about the contracting side? So again, we'll, let's not forget, um, sure. you know, Vinny's, Vinny's also on the contracting side. So what would you say to, I hear a lot of young people, um, they talk about flipping houses. They talk about, you know, starting mm-hmm. their own contracting business residential. What would you say to somebody that's looking to get a start, no experience in that world? Sure. So the number one thing is, well, one would be to find someone with experience. You know, if you don't, if you don't have the experience, you got to be able to hire people who, you know, who can help you. But as far as, uh, you know, getting work, I would say someone gave me the advice once of um, do something your competitors won't do. If you just Mm -hmm. do what your competitors won't do, you'll tend to get the job. So for me early on, something I realized was, And this gets harder the more successful you are. I catch myself now. It's harder for me to do. And and I'm sure some younger person will start beating me up on it in the future. Um, A a seasoned builder is going to walk in sometimes and just give a price to someone because Mm -hmm. they know. And they're busy. And they might not have the time to really write a whole estimate out. When I first started out and I was doing second floors and extensions and whole houses, I would write a three to four page PDF and email it to someone within a week. And they would be like, oh, I can't believe, you know, Vinny sent me this whole thing explaining everything that's included and not Johnny contractor walked in and said, Hey, 400,000 and left. Yeah. <laughs> and I got a lot of, and it, it sucked to spend that two hours to write that. But people were like, Oh, he's so detailed. So I would say, mm-hmm. you know, my competitors were not willing to do that. You know, now I see myself sometimes where I struggle and I'm like, okay, I have to get a staff to help me out and do these things because I'm getting more busy, but um, doing things your competitors won't do. So just find whatever it is. For me, it was them giving detailed estimates that really helped me stand out and kind of do bigger jobs, especially when you're younger, right? Because people are going to look at you and say, why do I give my life savings to you? So yeah. Yeah. Listen, uh, this isn't like promoting ageism or anything like that, but when you're, when you're in Vinny's world, like he said, these are, these are major life decisions. These are people's dreams coming true when they spend yeah. tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars on a home. 
we're yeah. at we're at a point now with because the, the cost and society and everything that's going on depending on when you bought your home some of our renovations are breaching the price of what they paid for the home so there are people yeah. who bought homes for 450,000 and now have to spend 550 to 600 to mm -hmm. rebuild it so it, it's it's crazy some there are some people that wear, wear their biggest investment in life if you're a school teacher and a firefighter and you're remodeling you know basically knocking your house down and rebuilding it chances are you'll spend more money on the rebuild than you did when you bought it that's crazy. And I see people on TikTok all the time complaining about how they think that they should be making 150, 200 grand a year. You know, and they're like, I just got a degree. That's supposed to be the experience. You know, I posted that some, some girl was in a car flipping yeah. out about it. And it's like, what do you have to show somebody that's going to like give you their life savings to yeah, make no. their dream come true? Like, yeah, you got to find a way to separate yourself. You got to go the extra mile. You got to go show detail. You got to show them that you care. And it's an opportunity to show them that you know what you're talking about, right? All that detail that you showed, it was an opportunity to make them feel comfortable, even though, you know, you, you and I are still young guys in the industry comparatively, right? Because they say, like you said, it's an old man's business. Um, you know, th those are the things that you got to do. So I think, well said, I think that's, I think that's good advice. Uh, so where can people find you? Um, you know, all of the businesses that you got going on, where can they find you and your content? Yeah, so uh, at Amal Construction, as you mentioned, we, uh, also uh, amalconstruction.com. Um, we try to post a lot of our, we do a lot of progress uh, videos and photos throughout there of what's going on because we do find that a lot of customers, um, they, you know, sometimes the boring, you know, the pictures are kind of even boring. People like the actual us working and seeing stuff that's yeah. going on. Right. Um, and, then, and then for the architecture uh, at Trinity Designs LLC, uh, we've actually been so busy. I didn't even get the website up yet, but I'm going to try to get that up soon. Um, <laughs> well, to listen to that, that though. I mean, look how well you've done off a of word of mouth yeah. in the network that you've built if you don't even have a website. We're not, I'm not even listed on Google yet. It's been, we're in year one and I haven't, it's just been from word of mouth, like you said, and and, and networking with people is, is really an important uh, part of it. You got to hire some people. <laughs> yeah. I do. Yeah. We're very lucky. I actually have a, I have a person from grad school that I, uh, that I hired and, and this is just, I know we're wrapping up here, but just to show something, my full-time yeah. employee lives in Connecticut. So I, I'm in New York, but this is yeah. the flexibility that the world lives in today. He's in Connecticut and uh, we have two part-timers here on the island, but my main guy is not even here, which is awesome. And uh, yeah. They, yeah. A lot of people don't understand uh, the freedom that the business can give you. You know, um, people think boots and jeans, they forget there's an architect, they forget there's an engineer, they forget there's a GC like me. I'm working on 28 projects. Sure. I, li I live in Florida. I'm in New York City <laughs> right now, right? I, I have a project in Vancouver. Like it, I couldn't get further. Oh, like, I'd, have to, I'd have to be in Alaska to get any freaking further from my house <laughs> with a job that I have right now, right? So the world is yeah. different today. Like you, you have a different kind of freedom in this industry that I don't think, and that allows you to travel too. I mean, I'm, you know, you're not traveling Long Island, uh, but if you wanted to, you could take your career other places. You know, like sure. I mean, I'd I've been on bachelor parties and had to pull out a laptop in Arizona and Arizona and do work. And I'm like, I can't even believe that I'm doing this right now. But you know, that's the world we live in. I'm go into a room real quick, take a quick conference call, send out a couple yeah. emails, you know, and tell some guys what to draw. And yeah, it's it's wild. The world has definitely changed. Yeah, there's no limit. There's no glass ceiling, and there's uh, there's definitely no chains holding you down. So, listen, Vinny, I appreciate you coming on um, again. Sure. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. You gave a unique perspective that I think a lot of young people um, need to hear. And I think, I think one that'll be interesting for people to hear because we haven't had an architect on yet. So um, awesome, again, go, it. go follow his content at Trinity designs, LLC on Instagram. And uh, I'll make sure I tag him in the, in the posts and I'll, I'll be sharing some of his content. So Vinny, thanks buddy. Awesome, man. Thank you. Good to see you.